as you heard and saw, um, the Millennium Technology Prize really is like the Nobel Prize of emerging sciences and technologies. Uh, it's highly distinguished and it attracts people from all over the globe of extremely high caliber, including our speakers today. And we're going to be hearing from each of them. Now, I need to warn you, our panelists' bios kind of read like superhero epic journeys. And frankly, I couldn't pronounce or fathom half of the research and accolades that they have accomplished in their lifetimes. From energy master planning with carbon financing to terrestrial observing and mesoscale meteorology to air, sea, air, land, energy exchange and low frequency oscillation. I mean, whew, went completely over my head. So by the end of it, I almost wanted to throw on a cape and go tackle climate change myself. Um, you'd be hearing my voice all afternoon if I went through all of the distinguished accolades and rewards that these people have won. So what I've done is put them all up um, when each of the speakers are introduced. And I'll just introduce them briefly one by one. And the first speaker for today is Professor Fu Chongping. And he is the Vice President of China Association for Science and Technology. He also sits on many chairs as a member of the Chinese Academy of Science and Research, a research professor for the Institute of Atmospheric Physics, a director at START Regional Center for Temperate East Asia. He's a chief scientist at the National Basic Science Project, chair of Scientific Steering Committee, and a scientific advisor of the Environmental Protection Committee of the State Council. He's also a joint professor at Nanjing University and Lanzhou University. He's a graduate of the distinguished China Academy of Science, and he's no stranger to rewards himself in the natural sciences regarding climate variability and dynamics. If you want to know anything about a monsoon, he is your man. So, Professor, if we could have you come on stage for your talk, please. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. It's been a great pleasure to be when I invited to this event. What I'm going to introduce a little bit my group in the Nanjing University and the research work we have done related to climate and the environment. Uh, the title I'm uh, I'm going to talk to you is the integrated measuring the open environment at the station in Nanjing uh, since uh, five years ago. In the last nearly 10 years, I mainly focus on the three things. One is I establish an institute for climate and global change research in Nanjing University which is uh, close in disciplinary schools with the joint of eight schools, uh, social science, geological science, uh, geographic science, atmospheric science, environment science, and also the biological science as well. This is one uh, founded in 2009. The another one is the uh, the, we call the Collaborative Innovation Center for Climate Change in the Jiangsu province, which is joint effort, more than 10 universities and institutions. The third work I'm done is initiate three integrated platforms for observations of climate and environment in critical regions of the Earth systems. I'm particularly interested in this type of project because I thought the first hand measurement is most necessary for research and innovation. We have three stations, two over the North China, focus arid and semi arid regions. When it's over northeast China, focused on process of the land atmospheric interaction studies, which the component of the land surface process, atmospheric chemistry aerosols, atmospheric boundaries, and structures boundaries and meteorologists as well. There's another station over the Los Plata area. This is another uh, regions over the same regions, but the western end of the 
similarities. The reason for this station is because the dust rails, of the origin of the dust rails of that area, which has strong impact on the moment and climate all over the China, as well as goes through the Pacific, even to the other coast of the Pacific regions. It's also including boundary of meteorology, surface radiation monitorings, atmospheric chemistry, dust rails, and air variations. The number three I'm not I'm going to talk to a little more is is in in the Nanjing. This is states of Nanjing, is the campus of Nanjing University. We call it the the reason for the softbox, we can see this is the uh, area of the most urbanization areas. All right, you can see from the night lights, from the satellite, you can see the development of the urban urbanization of these regions. And here is the stations uh, we have established, focus on the whole the fast urbanization and intensive regional pollution in this particular regions intact with the climate. These are the main component we are set up in these regions. And this is the main process we are studied, including land atmospheric process, atmospheric hydrological process, and air pollution climate interactions, and hydrological water cycles in the regions as well. Here is the location of stations, uh, which is uh, the, in the preventive direction of the city of Nanjing, so which can be in the reference of a measurement of the monitoring to air conditions over the city of Nanjing. Here's the list of inspiration at the stations, which including all the elements related to climate and environment. We have used these stations for the a number of campaigns related to this particular events, such as heavy pollution days and many events as well. Here is just examples we how we use this multiple variable measurement to study the particular e events which are interesting. This one is in the, we can recall in the two years ago, almost the same time, the June 10th, we have very polluted areas, uh, days in the city of Nanjing and the nearby of the Jiangsu areas. Here we can see the biomass burning areas in the north, to the north, east, northwest of the city of Nanjing, and also we can the fossil fuel emission of the city. Then we use all these elements, including the concentration of all the species of dust measures, then also the surface radiation budget measurement and the temperature and other uh, profile of the disease. We can see this particular events with high population pollutants. The temperature is much below the forecast. It's about 10 degrees below that. Not only surface, but also the surface boundary rails will become very stable. This is mainly because of reduced radiations budget. Uh, there is strong feedback between the boundary rail and the atmospheric uh, pollutant. Here we use the uh, numerical model to try to, to improve the forecasting. When we including the improvement of the temperature, then we can see the original forecasting with the rainfall actually does not appear because of this particular pollutant events. So they, we can see the heavy air pollution even can modify the weather. So when you make the weather forecasting, even you have to take in account the pollution uh, conditions. This is the model we develop, how the uh, agricultural uh, biomass burning combined with the fossil fuel combinations it will change the boundary rails as well as cloud precipitating in actions to make modification of the local vessels as well. This is one question. There's a lot of uh, research being done in our group Try to link the basic research with the policies. First one is what we need to be controlled. How to control with the lowest economic cost? You see the left side is including 
increasing the acid rain with the decrease in the coastal particles. As you know, the acid rain has been reduced very rapidly because of pollutant control. However, when you reduce the coastal particles, then we'll be increasing acid rain again. The left side shows you the, if we control the NOx, it will increase in ozone pollutant in the Yangtze River. So we have to take account interactions, chemical interactions between the species of the pollutants. Uh, another one, uh, so uh, we all know that the pollutants are transported by the atmosphere. So may, we must take in account the regional transport of this kind of. That we, we use the observation in our stations and we use the models to simulate how the pollutants can be uh, pr transported. And we can translate, trust the where come this come of the come pollutants. And this will be useful for regional co coordination of the pollutant control. Here is another one, it's the ozone uh, episode, how the, the pres coast of the ozone uh, comes from in, in, in this particular region of Yangtze Delta, and also the PM2. So what? Well, so a few remarks on the implication of the city environment managed policy to combat the joint effect of agricultural gam biomass burning with the urban pollution together. Second, to consider the chemical reaction among the different species of pollutants. So when there's regional coordination, fourth, when the data sharing and joint analysis among research and managing. Thank you very much. Our next speaker is Walter Dabbert. He is the corporate scientific advisor to Vaisala. And he was born in Brooklyn, New York, though has chosen more beautiful surroundings in Boulder, Colorado as of late, even though I'm sure he flies all around the world uh, to conferences such as this. His superhero power is meteorology, and he knows everything about it. He joined Vaisala in 2000, and he's held the positions of the Director of Strategic Research, Chief Science Officer, and is currently the Corporate Science Advisor. Prior to joining, he spent 15 years at the National Center for Atmospheric Research as scientist, observing technology, facility manager, and NCAR associate director, even though he was the de facto chief operating officer. Previously, Dabbert was a senior research meteorologist at the Stanford Research Institute, now known as SRI International, and his professional interests and experience include urban scale meteorology and dispersion, terrestrial observing systems, boundary layer and mesoscale me meteorology, air quality, and fluid modeling. At the moment, he's actually working um, with the team at US Congress to push a bill on weather systems management um, and figuring out the consequences of all that. So welcome, Professor Walter Dabbert. Oh, thank you very much for that very uh, kind introduction. And it's great to, uh, to be in Shanghai always. I, I love Shanghai. In the next few minutes, I'd like to leave you uh, with thoughts on four questions. What is high impact urban weather and why is it important? Thirdly, what is uh, weather clean tech? Is the, a terminology that may be new to most of you and why is it important? But before I do that, let me try to set the stage for why urban and urbanization is so important. We have great growth in the cities. At the same time, population is increasing. The climate is changing, and there is a movement toward the coast. If you put these four factors, these four forces together, there are many of us who believe there is a perfect storm in the making, and that perfect storm is going to be focused on the cities, particularly the megacities, and most of the world's megacities lie in the Pacific Rim. So what future changes will there be uh, in the cities in terms of weather and climate? How is this going to affect the types of products and services that have to be made available to the cities and those living in the cities? And how can weather clean tech be a help in all of this? So it's no secret. Uh, the U.S. has been an urbanized nation for a long time with roughly three-quarters of the population living in cities, but they're small cities. 
China has had, excuse me, rapid growth uh, in the last few decades, particularly in the urban areas, and now has about 50% of the population in China living in cities. At the present time, globally, there are almost 4 billion people who live in the cities. And the startling statistic is by 2050, that number will grow to almost 6.5 billion people living in the cities. And frankly, we have to do a better job in the atmospheric and weather domain to support those people. When we think about weather in the city, and Professor Fu has made a great point uh, in his, his presentation, not only does the atmosphere impact the city, but the processes that are going on in the city have a large impact on the atmosphere. And it's this two-way dynamic that is so important and so unique to the cities that it warrants our full attention. So, urbanization. Uh, how does urbanization affect the atmosphere? The principal way that urbanization affects the atmosphere is through uh, the, the change of the land surface from, from grasslands and trees and forests to steel, concrete, asphalt surfaces. Their thermal characteristics are very different than the thermal characteristics of the natural landscape. In addition to that, we have anthropogenic heat that's released to the atmosphere. Every time we turn on an air conditioner, we actually are exp exporting heat into the atmosphere. And as we're going to hear in just a little bit, as the temperature in the city gets warmer than in the rural areas, there's more demand for air conditioning and other electric-powered uh, uh, processes. So now we're putting more emissions into the atmosphere, and it's a, it's a vicious cycle. And as Professor Fu pointed out, it can be to the point where we are putting in enough emissions into the atmosphere, we actually control and modify the amount of solar radiation, sunshine intensity that actually reaches the ground surface. Put all of these things together and it becomes a very complicated problem. So what are some of the weather-related impacts that we find in the cities? There are some who believe, uh, and it's a growing hypothesis, that the large cities of the world actually have an impact on the way that thunderstorms form and how they grow and develop. Uh, we, we know that the wind field is different in the cities with flow being channeled through these very tall skyscrapers down urban street canyons and the like. Flooding is a major problem in the cities because uh, of all of the asphalt uh, and other concrete surfaces that we have in the cities. Uh, and I personally experienced this uh, earlier this week. I was in Nanjing when we had flooding, moderate flooding conditions, but it was a major disruption throughout the city. Heat waves and air pollution are obviously two impacts uh, that we're very much familiar with. So what is the urban heat island? Very briefly, uh, as a consequence of the different thermal characteristics of the city and the way in which that affects the surface energy balance, we find that the core of the city is warmer than the rural areas. The increase in temperature caused by the urban heat island can be on the order of a few degrees Celsius, but in some cases it can be more than 10 or 12 degrees Celsius. And as I mentioned a few minutes ago, this puts on ex extra demand for energy consumption, that puts more heat into the atmosphere, it puts more pollutants into the atmosphere, and it's a vicious feedback cycle. We have warmer temperatures, we have increased pollutant emissions, and in the end, we find out, unfortunately, we have increased mortality and morbidity. How bad can it be? Well, I've just put on this slide a few examples over the last couple of decades of some significant uh, heat waves. And uh, the one that I pay most attention to, they're all important. Actually, I was in Chicago during this one. But in 2003, there was a epic heat wave in Northern Europe. And although the official figure was reported as 30,000 excess deaths as a result of this heat wave, and most of those, by the way, were in the cities, 
The revised estimates now double that. So the latest estimates are there were 60,000 excess deaths because of that heat wave. Now, the role of weather uh, clean tech. And then I'm going to tell you later, I'm going to open the curtain and tell you what weather clean tech really is. But uh, it allows us to develop responsible control strategies for how to reduce emissions in a logical way to control air pollution. It allows us uh, to develop adaptation and mitigation strategies to deal with the adverse high impact weather conditions in the cities. Uh, it allows us to do uh, real-time numerical prediction and forecasting, both for weather and for air pollution. And not to be overlooked, it also provides an important support function in the case of emergency response, uh, chemical spills, uh, train wrecks, and the like. So what is weather clean tech? Well, I think of weather clean tech as having three components. There is the hardware or technology side, the traditional technology side, which consists of, a, of atmospheric measurement systems. There are weather prediction models, software uh, that uh, uses the, uh, the atmospheric equations of motion and state and, and heat transfer. Uh, another type of uh, weather clean tech. And then, not to be overlooked, there is what's called the value-added products and services where we take the output of the forecast and we, we translate it, if you will, in terms that business and individuals can use to make decisions, to optimize their business operations, and in the case of the public, to optimize the way in which they can enjoy their lives. Now, I would like to focus the talk, the rest of the talk, on the, the, the measurements uh, technology that's one third of that weather clean tech picture. And I'd like to start by talking about the evolution of weather radar, which started out, actually, its, uh, its uh, origination was in World War II. It was used to detect ships and aircraft. But the operators found that sometimes the signal got very noisy. And what was their noise is gold to the meteorologists, because that noise was the weather. Weather was having an impact on the radar signals. So we've taken advantage of that over the decades. And today, we have a very sophisticated radar system across the US, throughout much of the world, which puts out uh, a, uh, two, two beams, one in the vertical, one in the horizontal. They're both polarized. Uh, as a result of that, you take the return signal, you process it in a very sophisticated way. And not only are you able to see, traditionally, the presence of liquid or solid water in the, uh, in the clouds, but you can actually now determine the state of the water. You can determine, are they large raindrops? Are they small raindrops? Uh, is it graupel? Is it hail? Is it snow? You can make, with this information, a better estimate of what the amount of precip falling out of the clouds is. Very, very powerful technology. Not only that, we are increasing the capability of our Doppler winds. Doppler uh, simply is a way for us to, to get the horizontal and vertical motion of the raindrops and snowflakes and whatever comes out of the clouds. Now we have the ability to actually get extremely high resolution images of tornadoes. This is not in operation yet. It's still in the research phase. But we can make earlier uh, determinations of when a tornado was going to form, something called the hook echo forms. When that forms, we know that a tornado is very likely to both form and to come down to the ground. So today, we have a current warning time of about 14 minutes uh, in terms of issuing warnings for tornadoes. With this type of technology, we may be able to increase that by 50%. We may get close to 20 minutes. And don't think of tornadoes only happening in Tornado Alley in the rural part of the United States. Trust me, there will be a time. I don't know if it'll be next year or five years from now, but there will be a major tornado that will go through a major urban area. And we have to give people 
and officials as much warning as possible. So this is a very important part of what I call weather clean tech. So let's shift to something we're all concerned about. I just pulled up my app on my phone a few minutes ago and I saw that the PM 2.5 in Shanghai for the last hour was uh, 90 micrograms per cubic meter. So what the heck is PM 2.5? Well, it's a particle, very, very fine, that in its cross-sectional dimension represents two and a half millionths of a meter. Okay, what the heck does that mean? Well, think in this drawing, th think of this as a cross-section of a human hair. The average human hair has a diameter of about 60 micrometers or microns, as it's called. So you could put in about 25 of these little PM 2.5 particles in cross-section. If you had a sphere made the diameter of, of a human hair, you would have more than 13,000 of these little PM 2.5 particles compressed inside of that if, if that's what, in fact, you wanted to do. That's just a little aside. So, next. In order to be able to predict and ultimately to control uh, particle pollution, PM 2.5, not only do we need to know what the concentrations are at ground level, we need to know what the concentration is from the ground level up to the top of something called the mixing layer. Some people call it the boundary layer. The terms aren't really equivalent, but for today, let's consider that they are, that people use them interchangeably. Now, if we look at some data that came out of Beijing, what we find is that about one-third of the pollution in Beijing during some high episode conditions was not generated in Beijing. It was imported into Beijing from the southwest and from the south. The remaining two-thirds, though, was locally uh, emitted. So that means if we wanted to reduce the emissions uh, in the Beijing area, and probably they're going to have to be reduced ultimately by about 90% in order to meet the air quality standards for PM 2.5. Not only are we going to have to do it locally, we're going to have to somehow hope that our neighbors will be doing the same thing so that what they transport to us will also be reduced. Well, to figure all of that out, we really need to know the vertical structure of the boundary layer or the mixing layer. How do we do that? And why am I showing you a picture of a searchlight? Well, this is actually how the technology started about 60 years ago. We used searchlights and geometry to figure out what was the height of the base of clouds. Okay, we don't do it that way anymore. We have technology uh, similar to what uh, the company I work for makes that employ a laser. We shoot the laser up into the atmosphere. Okay, it gets reflected off of the cloud. We measure the time it takes to get to the cloud. We know the speed of light. We know how high the cloud is. But these devices now have very good sensitivity. Not only can they see the bottom of the cloud, but they can actually now see the fine particle structure in the boundary layer. So this is a vertical profile at one point in time of what the particle or aerosol concentration, relative concentration, looks like from the ground surface up through the, through the mixing layer. This is the kind of information we need to fully understand and predict uh, air quality, but also it's very important for the prediction of a lot of meteorological phenomena. So I'm going to go to the next slide. And just give you sort of uh, air chemistry 101. If you want to estimate what the concentration of a pollutant is, you can employ something called a simple box model, which says that the concentration of a pollutant is going to be governed by the amount of emissions and inversely by the wind speed and by the depth of the mixed layer. Well, we need to know what the depth of the mixed layer, the because the day-to-day -day variation in air quality are not caused by day-to-day -day variations in emissions. They're caused by day-to-day -day and hour-to-hour -hour variations in meteorology. And an important part of the meteorology is the mixing height. 
and with the uh, what's called the LIDAR salometer uh, that I showed you before, we actually will get a vertical profile every few seconds. We can stitch them together and we can put together a time, height, cross-section, and we can actually see what the fine structure is of the particles as a function of height and of time, and we can also automatically determine the depth of the mixed layer. This is a significant advance in the area of uh, weather clean tech. But we need more than that. We also need to know the corresponding vertical profile of water vapor. Water vapor is essentially is essential to our understanding and our ability to predict the atmosphere. It controls to a large degree the way in which these particles grow. Many of these particles are actually like little sponges and they can actually take on water vapor from the atmosphere and grow. Uh, water vapor is important because combined with the higher temperatures in the city, it exacerbates the heat stress. Very, very uh, important. It affects visibility and it also affects thunderstorm initiation and development. Right now, we don't have a technology in operation that will actually measure water vapor in the atmosphere in the same way that we are measuring aerosols or particulates. But in the research domain, we now are developing a new weather clean tech, clean tech technology uh, called DIAL, which means differential absorption LIDAR. And it offers the promise in a few years to be a technology that we can deploy in our weather observing systems uh, around the world to be able to get that very important and much needed uh, water vapor information. Now, I want to stop with technology in the next slide because technology is not going to be the answer to all of the world's urban problems. There are lots of cities around the world that have very little technology and don't have the promise of a solution from technology. These are the world's squatter cities or so-called shadow cities. One in every six people in the world lives in a squatter city. More than a billion people today. And I submit that we as a community need to figure out how can we contribute to making the world a better place for the people living in the squatter cities. And so I want to leave you with the words of a philosopher from the 1960s. You may know of Robert Zimmerman. Some people know him as Bob Dylan. And uh, he was very prophetic in the song he wrote in the 1960s. I think he may be talking about climate change and urbanization because he's talking about the waters are growing and we're roaming and so forth. But I think there's a very strong message here for all of us. To the bone, if your time to you is worth saving, then you better start swimming or you'll sink like a stone or the times they are And thank you very much. Our third speaker is David Nia, and he is the head of China for land lease. He's a registered architect and a certified planner, and as well as an accredited professional in sustainable design. He serves as an advisor on an impressive number of boards, as you can see here. Um, and they range from strategic economies to creative communities to campus development, education, social innovation, biotech, and public art. So it's quite a span. His projects are large scale and urban focused, so he'll be able to answer some of the questions about how do you build for these urban heat islands? What are we going to do? And it's all the more imperative that he actually uses a lens of social benefit and energy sustainability as his key principles, which of course has made him a desirable speaker, an advisor, and a winner of many awards. So let's welcome David to the stage. Well, it's a pleasure to be back here at KIC. Um, this is a project I actually worked on for almost 10 years. One of the things we tried to do here uh, very much was bring in the culture of innovation, and we visited Finland uh, quite a few times. and. Uh, I have a close friend named John Kao who wrote a book called Innovation Nation, a, on, a critique on the US, but he really pointed to Finland really in all the metrics as being the most innovative nation in the, in the world. 
So um, with that, uh, what I wanted to do was share with you some of the wonderful things that uh, Professor Fu and Dr. Dabbert have been speaking about and through the different scales of to looking at from country to region to cities and then bring it back down to the ground to a development level uh, to see what we can potentially do together to help accelerate the world of clean tech innovation and urbanization. Uh, this is a project my current company, Lendlease, is doing in uh, Sydney. It's the last uh, CBD area, an extension towards the uh, Darling Harbor. And it is a project that is uh, one of the 18 Clinton climate positive projects around the world. These are projects of scale that are carbon neutral, zero water, zero waste, uh, both pre-construction and post-construction. So our company has done four of those. You can see they're circled here around the globe, and uh, that's one of the reasons I joined this company, was to put the first one here in China. And so we always measure things. So as uh, Professor Fu and Dr. Davert have been showing you, measurement is very important. We don't just build it and walk away, but we look at how the, these things measure. There's a few key concepts I want to leave you with today. One is that we want to always look at things in a very holistic manner. We don't want to look at things building by building, but rather as a holistic district in many different ways. And these ways, coming back to the world of clean tech, include energy, water, waste, and also we're measuring things in carbon. And these holistic systems can also be designed with uh, urban agriculture and other things also starting to embed into these, which I think is also going to be quite exciting. Um, so these are some systems we used at Barangaroo to achieve the uh, energy solutions. And then what, as a developer, I really look for is that there are a series of inputs, you know, energy, waste, water. There are a series of outputs, sewage, landfill, trash, etc. So how do we get these to cycle back upon themselves in self-sustaining energy cycles, water cycles, and waste cycles? And then furthermore, making it more fun, how do we get these to cycle together? And that's where the magic starts to unlock. So for example, I can take a solar panel. Solar panel from the energy cycle drives a water pump in the water cycle. The water is pulled up and it irrigates uh, my landscape. Landscape I can collect in biomass and I could take it to an anaerobic digester, therefore creating another energy cycle. So these things can also cycle upon each other. Uh, and that's where putting it together in this whole systems thinking approach uh, really uh, makes it. So we're talking about innovation today. Innovation is also very closely linked to entrepreneurship. Entrepreneurship is taking all these really great ideas and how do you make a sustainable business model, a business case of these. And again, we look at inputs and outputs. And then we set these up so that we look at targets. And the targets and developments occur at the building level, at the infrastructure, and then access to the developments, so transportation level. These are all very important. And by starting to connect these things, you can see in the right-hand column how you can continue to compound and reduce uh, energy and carbon. Uh, these are the buildings actually right across the street. These were set up as some of the most sustainable buildings here in China, uh, looking at uh, a uh, potential low-carbon uh, net zero concept. So these were the first buildings here actually pushing this, and I think it's remarkable. They're just literally across the street. And then you can see what we would do is we would take a lot of these strategies, and then we would map these into these cycles and see how we can uh, look at a very aggressive scenario using 21 strategies, a less aggressive scenario, and then ultimately, what do we start with first? In China, there's a famous saying, xian yi hou nan, which is simple first, complex later. We don't want to start with so many things so fast off the bat that all these things get confused and it's very hard to implement. So that's one of the other key things in innovation and where I also learned from Finland, a lot of the Finnish systems are so beautifully conceived and designed that there's a certain elegance and robustness to them that they, 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 they sustain themselves, for example, with very little maintenance, which is very good here in China. We talked about access and mobility, you know. So where is China going to be in uh, 15 years' time? You know, right now, there's still a high majority in bicycles and, and pedestrians, the first mode of transport. The U.S. is inverse. 
EU and Japan are other different models, but China will find its own model as we move forward, and uh, that'll be a very, very important to how we solve also a lot of energy equations and the climate change and all these other things as cars put um, a lot of pollution into the air, but not just even the electric vehicles. It's not the electric vehicles are clean, it's the power source. And so that is a compounding effect. So there are a lot of site-wide strategies. And on each one of these, we, of course, measure. This is a development I was working on in northeastern China. And we were looking at very aggressive targets to reduce uh, energy waste and water by one-third to two-thirds to almost in total. And how do we measure these strategies? To, on a business case, we have to look at profitability or what are the economics behind it. And on the other y-axis, what is the impact? And instead of, so the green is uh, probably something high priority and also um, makes economic sense. Red is uh, stop or you know, really reevaluate this. And we started putting all these strategies together on the board, almost like a checkers, and looked at each one of these also by themselves as well as holistically. You know, and the inputs again of price, pricing in, uh, to policy, electricity, uh, carbon pricing, you know, and all these other things to figure out our business model. So scientific models are incredibly important and they lead to business models. The business models then need to look at the technologies to be implemented to make all this happen. Uh, energy, uh, China has a very interesting energy pricing policy. Most of it is uh, really borne by the um, co commerce and industry and really safeguards the residents. So uh, you can see the blue lines of residents, no matter if you are using energy at what time, your energy rate is the same, does not promote uh, very good energy conservation in general. And we also look at it on a daily or diurnal cycle. When is uh, excess energy coming and when is excess uh, uh, energy demand increasing? And in the differences in these periods, we can look at also battery storage systems uh, to see how we can continue to hold in, uh, energy on site. And rather going out and creating more batteries, which can be more pollution, and, but there's a lot of great battery technologies that are more organic and cellulose-based, which can biodegradable, be very important. As we looked at different ways of storing energy, either uh, thermally as ice and compression as air. Uh, a good friend of mine is the chief uh, scientist for Disney. Disney, all those rides, they're powered by air, so compressed air is a very good energy uh, battery system for them. Um, and we use electric cars. Cars are plugging into developments now. You're starting to hear this from Elon Musk, other people, but this notion has already been ongoing in research at Stanford and other places already for 15 years. Uh, the other one is uh, UPS. A lot of the batteries, we can use computers. Computing is not just for data, but also information but also energy storage. So these are all ways we're looking at this. So in a place like this, which is very rich in computers, the computers can also double and use as energy source. Another key thing is about demand management. You know, whether it's water, energy, or anything else, usually at the, sor at the user point, it's only a fraction of what it is upstream because there's a lot of wastage, waste and slippage along the way. Uh, in China, typically, you know, at the, uh, these coal plants, they burn it, 70% of that energy already leaves as heat. So that heat needs to be trapped in up to 70%. So uh, this is called a combined heat and power. So what China's trying to do is trap some of that heat, turn it back into turbine energy and make more. But by and large, in an average, in a conventional coal burning power plant, 70% of the heat goes up the chimney, which also further causes climate change and all the things. Uh, transmission loss, distribution loss, and conversion loss along the way that you're looking at almost 10 to 1 by the time you get there. So if you can save one unit here, you can uh, save 10 units up here. Uh, and then uh, looking at different uh, energy master plans and how we look at phasing, demand side reductions, as well as uh, balancing. This is actually the diagram that drives my career, my beliefs, my passion and really is the sustainability as a sweet spot between uh, and the protecting the environment, enhancing the environment, about social equity or equality, and also about economy. 
And then similarly, as we look at innovation, sustainment, and development, we also need to measure these things. Uh, we have objectives, we have targets, and we track them along the way. And in this, we tell the story about um, you know, people, profit, and planet. And this is a very balanced approach to looking at this. And then looking at it as a portfolio approach. Sure, each building only saves a little energy, little water, little waste. But once you start aggregating, adding them up, uh, it starts to be a much greater whole. And then as well as access to uh, culture and education and open space and et cetera. And then having real uh, live um, measuring systems that influence the user. Most users' uh, behavior can be uh, shifted or augmented through uh, um, certain former systems. So Dr. Davert was talking about the AQI on the app. You know, these things we can start to see and see how our own actions start to impact it or not. Uh, one of the things we did very closely, looking at some of the clean tech companies and how they set up a whole clean tech ecosystem, is to look at the demand side and the supply side. What is going on here in China? Uh, how do we create demand on awareness and also purchase of the products? Uh, demand side, especially being government in China. And on the supply side, what are the innovations and what are the employment and other support industries that need to come in? And then clean tech really is market, seeing how much of it is market driven, user uh, impact and whatnot. So from these, we started looking at how do we start to develop international centers of clean tech innovation. So this award I think is fantastic because it starts to celebrate these and starts to potentially uh, make all these uh, clean tech uh, innovation um, places spring up. So it sounds like Dr. Fu is already working on one of these type of platforms. Uh, the other thing we want to do is to upskill the workers. We want to take blue collar workers and turn them into green collar workers. So there's a whole necessary group of workers needed to make all this clean tech happen. Because clean tech, unlike TMT and other things, has to constantly be installed, maintained, engineered. It takes people. And then on the demand side, uh, developments like KIC, the developments I'm working on, Lendlease, uh, we really need to create the demand by designing and developing those uh, developments that will utilize these energy, waste, and water systems. I learned a new one today, uh, weather clean tech as well. So we started looking at how do we start to organize this you know, from the demand, from regional demand to external demand. Uh, I think there are national markets and global markets. Uh, and then what are the driving industries and in renewables, energy efficiency, impact reduction? Uh, and then what are the supporting industries? So you have to look at the whole chain. And I have my, some of my close friends are some of the top venture capitalists in clean tech. And the clean tech is actually a very tough word to actually say in Silicon Valley these days because it's been very, very difficult. And one of the key things is you've got to be able to control the supply and distribution. And then downstream, the installation and the maintenance, as well as all the different uh, decision makers along the way. Whereas in IT space and getting things on the web, this is uh, much easier. Okay? Um, and then what are the value-added environments? So we just spoke about skilled workforce, the venture capital, the research institutions. And also you need a group of entrepreneurs out there promoting and taking that risk and uh, working with uh, investors as well as banks. And, and then government can really help support and shift the demand by promoting policies against all this. And Finland has done that very well. China is doing it better and better. Uh, and then in the end, also, in my business, having the available land and other resource. Uh, I've got about a minute left. I want to show you just something fun. Uh, you can, these things happen all scales, right? We're talking about country, region, city, block. You know, how about, a, how about an office? So we uh, recently redesigned our office. Uh, we have nine plants per person. There was a famous uh, research paper written by NASA, and it, what it stipulated was that when Apollo 13 came back, they almost ran out of oxygen. So they said, what's the best way to ensure this never happens again? Well, plants are one way. So we have nine plants per person. They're specially picked, uh, just, um, selected plants that help generate oxygen, actually help take VOCs and all the things out of the air. Uh, on a given day, uh, our um, carbon dioxide count is around 300 in the office. This is a pre-industrial uh, 
age uh, count. Before the age of industrialization, burning of coal, the earth was about 300. Ours is usually 300 or less. Uh, but also the amount of oxygen and other things in there. And the other thing is to, uh, to control the humidity and thermal comfort and all these things. Uh, our carpets are made from recycled uh, plastics from the ocean. You can see we have bamboo all over the place. Uh, our, this, our counter desk is uh, recycled Corten steel. And here's an environment in our office where you can see there's actually no lighting in the ceiling. The ceiling, uh, the lighting all comes from these uh, up and down LED lights. We've monitored our space now for one year. We're using 40% less energy in the typical office space in China. And then these uh, plants are very, very effective for giving off oxygen, sequestering carbon. Uh, some of my friends from South Asia call these uh, mother-in-law's tongue. They're long and sharp. <laughs> but they're very effective and they take very little water. Uh, we also have a very, very active recycling program. Uh, we've measured it now. About, we measure about, we uh, recycle by 85% of the content in our office. Nobody has a trash bin by their desk. They're, they can print, but it means you have to get up and throw it away and people think twice when they do that. If they get up like me, it's good, a little good exercise. Uh, but it's typically the reverse. Most offices in, in China, but not just China, usually throw away about 85% and recycle 15. So, and then water, same thing in the air. So air coming out of our building and out of our space is cleaner than air coming in. Water coming out of our building, coming out of our space is cleaner than water coming in. Uh, this is our canteen, but uh, I wanted to share that with you. All these different scales, these wonderful things can happen, and I think this Finnish, Chinese, as well as global uh, compact with so many passionate people and so many smart people on it should not but only succeed. Thank you.